Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, for all those watching, please feel free to comment and ask questions during the webinar. And we'll do our best to answer them either during uh, the questions or at the end in the Q&A. Um, to get things rolling, I'm Chris Abbas, co-founder of the Hire Community, and our ambition is to level up the TA industry, providing a community for the very best talent professionals from around the world to share, learn, and grow their careers. And holding webinars like this is part of that. Uh, for those that aren't already members, you can join our free community of over 11,000 talent, 11, talent professionals at hirehq.com. And today I'm joined by an incredible panel of TA leaders, and we're going to be talking about a very pressing topic, how to build a high performance TA team. Given the recent boom and bust cycles in TA, many leaders will be going through a period of rebuilding or growing their TA functions. And it's more important than ever to understand how to drive performance in your team, build a framework for success and drive great business outcomes. So luckily, I have three people who have a lot of experience doing this for some of the world's best companies, um, and I'm really excited uh, to introduce you to them. So uh, we'll kick off. Um, Sam, do you want to go first? Sure. Uh, thanks, Chris. Um, hi, I'm Sam, uh, and I had a talent at OneSignal uh, based in San Francisco, and have basically spent my career um, helping tech companies scale um, and building leading um, talent teams at those companies. Uh, some highlights include Venmo, Airbnb, Fastly, now OneSignal. Uh, I'm also a recovering startup founder, um, so I'm very familiar with the incubator and startup scene as well. And yeah, I just really loved seeing the expansion of talent to not just be hiring incredible people, but to how we, you know, retain and support um, and grow those people. And yeah, excited to be here. Awesome. Thanks, Sam. Uh, Jerome. Hi, everyone. I'm Jerome. Um, I currently lead the TA team um, at WISE. Been here for about a year. Before that, I was at um, a company called Go Cardless, another fintech in the UK. And prior to that, I spent eight years at LinkedIn. Um, working in and leading the recruiting team in EMEA, and then um, eventually moving into the product marketing team. Um, and then this is my, my second t stint in finance. Uh, before that, I was spent a couple of years working at Barclays Bank as well. So it's lovely to meet you. Awesome. Cheers, Jerome. And last but not least, uh, Matthias. Yes. Hello. Welcome. Um, my name is Matthias. I'm currently Global uh, Director of Talent Acquisition and Employer Branding at Emnify. It's a Series B IoT uh, deep tech startup in Berlin. Um, have been doing also a lot of tech recruitment and at uh, tech companies before where I helped to scale them like Zalando Scout uh, and Beamery also, which was a London one. So I'm quite familiar with this space and happy to be here and share the expertise today. Awesome. So I guess, why don't we kick off from the beginning um, and how you go about hiring um, and getting the right people into your team and how important you feel that is um so how do you guys think about that and what are some of the successful ways you've you've kind of built and hired a high performing team sam you want to go first uh, sure um I mean, a lot of it's making sure that the values are the values are very aligned with what we're looking for uh in a talent function so so much of that is are they someone who prioritizes both an incredible candidate experience and someone who prioritizes um, delivering an incredible hiring manager partnership. And I use the word partnership very deliberately. Um, and also someone who then at the end of the day really cares about delivering for delivering for the business and hitting those metrics. Um, but I think it's so important that we're retying we're retying we're meaning behind those metrics um, and making sure that's really clear for that individual. So I really look for that that trifecta when I'm when I'm hiring someone. Yeah. And one of the things that you mentioned, Sam, was how to kind of really make sure that you had a real sense of your mission and purpose and values um, for not just the business as a whole, but also your team and your TA function. Um, so can you maybe talk about that? And do you do that before you go out hiring? Do you do, that, do you do that once you've got the team in? How do you think about that? Yeah. Um both in terms of when I'm hiring, um, like when I'm hiring for my talent team, then we're doing we're doing a values interview, of course, to make sure the values are aligned with the company, um, and to make sure they're kind of hitting those critical things that I'm looking for. But once they're once they're here, so like as soon as I join my role, 
was I think basically beginning of month two when I joined this role, sat my team down, we did a big brainstorming session to come up with our talent team mission, vision, and value specifically. And I thought that was a a really important exercise to involve them in that because I want them I want them connected to that. I want them to really care about delivering on the mission, vision, and values. And you're much more likely to care about it if you're a part of crafting it. Like then you feel it. Then you know everything you do is tying is tying back to that. And if one of those is, hey, I want to deliver on parallel candy experience, then we can look at day to day everything we do and see how it ties back to that. Because right in recruiting, it's so especially easy to get kind of, you know, your blinders on and very dialed into your day to day pipeline because there's so much going on. You can have so many candidates in your pipeline who constantly need responses. And I feel like if you've now had that mission, vision and values kind of brainstorm, it's easier to kind of come out of that day to day and tie it back to that impact. Um, and also allows when we're setting metrics of, you know, hey, we want to hit 30 days time to hire or something. Um, it's not just that's a metric. It's, oh, why is that important for delivering credible candidate experience, for being respectful of our interviews and hiring managers' time and making sure we're moving quickly to deliver for the business? It's really putting it's putting that meaning behind those metrics. Because, right, if you just set metrics and there's no meaning, like, that's not motivating. So you want to make sure they understand why that's in service of everything else. And then that makes it that much more easy to then go do brainstorming sessions around what improvements do you want to see? What projects do you want to work on? Like, this is your team. This is your process. It's not just me establishing things behind it. This is all of us. And I want to make sure you're bought into that. So if you kind of set your North Star, then it's a lot easier um, to then make improvements upon that and continually um, continually better the function. Mm -hmm. so, so when you've got the kind of values established, you, do you build out your kind of metrics and your kind of targets for the team off the back of that? So it could be, like you said, deliver a, an incredible hiring manager experience um, and then you say, okay, how do we do that? And that's how you build out the kind of important metrics to a function. Exactly. And you have everyone bought into those metrics. It's not just, hey, these are industry standards and we want to hit these. Like, sure, there's some of that. <laughs> but it's a lot of like, this is why that's important and why that's looked to as a standard. And then you're actually connected to it versus just, oh, I'm responsible for delivering X amount of hires per month. It's the, I think the why behind that is so important. Because, right, I want everyone um I want everyone on my team to feel like a business owner. Um, like you should be invested in, it, in that ownership. And especially if you under, you have that understanding from day one, you're so much more likely to be invested and want to take things to the next level. Yeah, awesome. And Jerome, I know that you uh, feel really passionate about getting the right people on board. So what, what's worked for you? Yeah, it's funny. Um, listening to Sam, I, you could see Sam's passion. Uh, <laughs> and I think it, it's it's kind of, it's kind of the first thing I look forward to when I, when I meet, um, I'm looking to hire anybody in my team, whether it's a coordinator, it's also a recruiter, is like, why, why do they do what they do? Or what's, what's the passion behind the craft for their job? Uh, I just want to ensure they're in the right role and, and make sure they're doing something that they're super passionate about. That's really, really important to me. So I often I don't have any kind of magical assessment for it, but I do like to ask people about their personal stories and why they've ended up in that profession and you know what what do they want to tell me about what they do and you can you can gauge people's answers i think through you know the, the, the tone of their voice the passion how they carry themselves the gesture of their hands um you can really tell the, the kind of the authentic passionate people about about the craft so i think that's really 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 important to start off with recruiting is one of those you know interesting and kind of unique industries that there's a relatively low barrier to entry like anyone from any background can really come into it and be incredibly successful um when you're looking for that passion and you're looking for the right people who are in the right roles have you typically found any trends like people coming from certain types of backgrounds or have had a certain you know been high level in sports or as a musician or you know something else um have you found there's any trends or is it really kind of person dependent um, I, I think there's definitely trends in the skill set. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that, I think personal traits and skill set. So if you think about resilience, often people have very deep rooted personal stories as to why they are, you know, they are who they are, I think. Um, resilience is one of those key traits in recruitment that if you're going to be successful and also make it a long term career that you need to have, um, you know, at stake. Um, the other side, the other flip side of that is 
there's an individual stories that people tell you when you meet. I think, and I keep thinking, actually, I was reading something the other day from I think it's Jim Miller at Ashby. Then he put, he put something on LinkedIn. Um, hi, Jim. Um, he put something on LinkedIn <laughs> around how he was having conversations about hiring people in the pub in the UK, right? And like how people get really passionate about referring other people. Like, hey, I know somebody. Somebody then put them in the pub, kind of, hey, I know my cousin who'd be really good at this. Um, <laughs> and having those personal stories about the impact that you have on people's careers, on people's lives, through you know, taking the next role or taking that career change and have been given that opportunity to excel at something. Um, when you hear people tell you those stories back, those personal stories, you can really gauge the authenticity and the passion from that. So I guess the answer to your question is, yeah, there is trends around the skill sets and the traits, but I think the individuality of the stories is, is what makes a difference. Yeah, great. Um, Matthias, um, what about you? What have you found to be a successful way of bringing in great people? Yeah, I, um, what I tend to look for for people when I interview them is I literally want them to solve problems. Like, how can they solve problems? I mean, most of the time what you see is you cannot always be next to them. You cannot always be there, right? Especially if you have a remote team or you have different time zones to tackle. So for me, it's really important. How do I understand the way they solve problems, but also what their thought process is. Because in the end of the day, if I'm out or nobody is there, I can trust that person to actually be, you know, um, a capable of, of solving certain situations without being there because I know their approach, their thought process. And I think especially what Sam mentioned um, came very close to my heart where it's about, you know, when people are building this on their own, trying to understand the why um, and are committed and have that buy-in, I think this is for leaders really important to create such a culture and environment. Like you could call this psychological safety where people are allowed to make mistakes, right? So many times I feel like, you know, if nobody speaks up, in your team, that's the problem, right? Because they may be uh, too afraid to, right? And it's such a culture where everybody is working towards one goal, that North Star that Sam mentioned, right? And where there is not just the opinion of the leader that counts, but everybody else, right? It's the idea that matters, not so much uh, who said it. I think these are powerful opportunities because I believe the complex, uh, complexity in our job has increased so much that, you know, you need to have that diversity of thought the different perspectives that help you actually to become better because you don't know it all as a leader, right? And if you have that ego or you that belief that you're the center of excellence, this is always not a good thing, right? And I think this is something which I always would look for and look out for, yeah. Is there a way that you assess that problem-solving skill in the interview and how do you, yes. how do you go about doing that? Yeah, and that's um, maybe a little bit different to people that people mentioned so far. I don't just have conversations or interviews. What I do is I don't want people to prepare like hours and hours for a case study or so. That's something I also disagree with. But what I do is scenario-based um, questions. So literally, they don't need to prepare anything. I will put and pick some scenarios in their day-to-day which actually really apply for their job. And they get also a little bit of sense of what kind of maturity do we have, hiring maturity, hiring managers that we deal with. And with those scenarios, it's like a couple of sentences just explaining a, a certain scenario. I kind of see, do they jump into the solution? Do they ask questions? Do they understand the data that I present? It's just about you know not solving so much the scenario here, but the thought process behind it and then the Q&As after that actually is the more interesting part, right? Because why have you done it like this? What is your experience behind it, right? And these things have worked well for me. And when I hired my team, my, my last team here at Amnify, they really said, this is the moment where you cannot lie or <laughs> cheat because literally you need to know your stuff, right? And yeah, yeah. for example, if that's uh, not uh, very generic for people, just imagine you give them a hiring funnel, you have the year's data, you have the conversion rates, you see the time spent on those different stages, and then they should assess, is this a good hiring funnel or not? Why mm -hmm. is this a good hiring funnel? Why would you change? Like, how would you change it, right? So and so many times you see that people are data-driven, but do they actually understand how to improve the data with certain initiatives? Understand a little bit, is this good or bad? Or what does that mean? That helps you a lot. And um, such things are also very easy to design. Yeah, that's awesome. I totally agree about the problem solving as well, because we're putting so many different types of situations as recruiters with different people, different roles different locations and we have to think on our feet and 
all the best recruiters I know are really good problem solvers. So I totally agree. It's made me think of something as we we're speaking about that, which I think is a challenge. And maybe I'm the only person who feels this way, but recruiting um, doesn't have like a standard framework in terms of progression. Uh, you know, like for example, what a senior talent partner is or a senior recruiter, what a you know, mid-level recruiter is, what a junior recruiter is. Um, and I've always found throughout my career, it's quite hard to say, okay, what are the differentiate what's the difference differentiation between them um and there's no real benchmarks out there that that help how how do you guys think about you know what is a senior recruiter in your business versus what is a kind of mid-level and maybe a junior and how do you think about that when you're composing your team and putting and putting that together um yeah who, who wants to go there i, I feel yeah. like you touched on actually a lot of the pieces when you're talking about that problem solving. Um, I think it's just an, ex for me, it's a lot of an extension of that and that level of autonomy that you're going to see as you go up the ranks. Like I don't expect a, a junior recruiter, like they'll have basic problem solving skills, but a lot of it situations they haven't encountered before. So I don't necessarily think they'll know how to um, like maybe work with a difficult hiring manager um, or to get them to kind of come along and might not be as adept at building that partnership, but I think they'll have the right kind of tools in place and kind of work with, um, work with their manager, work with their teammate on, oh, how do I go about this? I think if the general um, like desire to problem solve and the basics are there along with kind of the empathy of how to approach the situation and kind of the basic communication skills, um, then they'll get there. But it's a lot more on you might help them um, just for scenarios they haven't encountered before versus a senior recruiter who now has probably a lot more of, okay, I've seen it, I've done it, um, I've encountered that. They already have a playbook um, for how they're going to go about certain scenarios and a level of autonomy where, yeah, if you're going on vacation for a couple of weeks, you're confident that okay, they've got this handled. I know they can um, they can handle the tough questions. They're going to be able to present well. Um, oh yeah, some degree of, um, I guess, presentation to leadership too and how to handle a room of more senior people where especially a more junior person, if you're now like talking to the CEO in a scenario, they might not be as comfortable um, on how to bring them along versus now if you're a more senior recruiter. So I think there's just a level of, yeah, kind of maturity in what they've encountered. Anyone yeah, I think um, Go ahead. Sorry, I think we, sorry with the delay. Um, I think there's a couple of other vectors as well, which is um, I often go back to the role of a recruiter and how you wear different hats, right? So like for me, recruitment started off years ago, but it was primarily a sales role. And then it became like, then you had to become a marketeer and this idea of employer branding. And then you became an analyst, right? You have all this data available to you. So you could be able to like work out the funnels and to Matthias's point like developing that critical thinking skill. And then now I think you need to be this management consultant, right? You need to be advisory. You need to guide people through. Um, so you're wearing all these different hats. And I think often when you're looking at the progression of a recruiter, you're trying to test out what's their natural sweet spot across those four different roles that they can play and how do you help them incrementally get better at each of the four. So then I think that taps into some kind of probably like a framework to tap into, like how do you get your autonomy in each of those four um, elements? Um, and I, and I think that the, the, I think the secondary vector is that there used to be a trend. I think there was a preference for specialism. So mm -hmm. it used to be that, you know, if you're an angel recruiter, it's like, wow, you must be the best recruiter because you're an angel recruiter. And there was obviously a greater need. But at, at the end of it, that person is specialized in engineering. So there's no engineer recruitment to be done, which guess what? Isn't that the case? There's a bit of a transition pain and so I think that I think the thing today is like, how do you turn your specialists into generalists? And mm -hmm. I think that comes with that progression. I think you, people tend to have this, their comfort blanket around, I'm a marketing recruiter, or I'm a finance recruiter, or I'm an engineer recruiter, and I know the network, and I know the individuals, and I know the technicalities of each. But then over time, as you start developing your skill set as a recruiter, you apply to different functions, and you ramp up quickly, regardless of whether you're doing marketing, finance, HR, engineering, or product. You're able to kind of, take your knowledge and your skill set and apply to different specialisms over time and, and, and still deliver the same level of quality service and consulting approach. Mm. Yeah. On, yeah, and I would, yeah. And I would add to that as well as um, when we reach a certain seniority, I think what I would look at is also to say, 
can you teach other people in the team? Can you share your knowledge? Yeah. Um, is this something where you can explicitly, um, you know, mentor, start mentoring people um, and help have other people in the team that are more junior? Um, and also something that I would look at for more senior people is, did you create something beyond hiring that has an impact, a sustainable impact in the business? It's a hiring training, it's an employer branding, um, mm -hmm. EVP development, whatever it is, yeah? Something more meaningful that stays there. And, you know, you, you actually have an impact besides your day-to-day -day work. Um, and I think this is something where um, you can create something more meaningful. Um, and I would even say to um, uh, um, Jeremy, to your fact is not even different roles that you can hire, but maybe even able, you know, we were in this time with all of the layoffs, maybe even have the transferable skills to say, I can do L&D, I can do people, I can even, you know, be a little bit more of a, um, an asset to our company or to our people team uh, by moving out and then coming back in because most of the time then TA people get a holistic understanding about the people um, um, a project or the people uh, vision. And I think that's really, really important because if you don't know how contracts work, if you don't know how L&D works, if you don't know how other things work that are crucial to your day to day, you know, this makes you a better recruiter, even if you come back afterwards, right? So there's a learning path and learning journey on that as well. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I did a podcast with Carla from Reddit and her big thing was AQ um, is the new kind of EQ, uh, adaptability. And mm -hmm. she really indexes highly on making sure that all of her team members are incredibly adaptable. She doesn't want specialists at all. She only wants people who can come in and, you know, if there's a need in sales, they jump on it and they say, look, I can go and sort that out. If there's a need on engineering, they can do that too. Um, and that, that leads me on to, I guess, the, the next point really nicely is that I think a lot of talent leaders are thinking about what's happened over the last couple of years and, um, and how, you know, TA has gone through this big boom. It's been the last team to be hired, you know, lots of pressure to deliver and hire people with very tight deadlines. And then as soon as, the market has shifted and there's less headcount, they've been the first to be impacted. And so I think a lot of leaders are looking at, okay, how do we stop that happening? And I think the route to that is how do we make sure we are critical to the business's success and outcomes, even when you know headcount falls? And so when you think about um, building a TA team and setting them up, up for success once they're in the business, I know something that everyone here feels passionate about is making sure that the objectives of the team is really tied to the objectives of the company so can you talk about maybe how you've done that um and how the route you've done the best the best way you've been able to pair those two together um sam if you want to kick off yeah um yeah i think it's it's so much making sure that's kind of ingrained in the dna of the team that it's not just bringing on amazing people that's incredible that's a lot of work but it's so much more than that right because at the end of the day you don't want to bring in incredible people for them to for them to ever leave. Like you want your team being involved in the process that also keeps those incredible people there. And that goes to, you know, that's the employee engagement piece, that's performance management, that's talent, that's different talent development, that's trainings, that's D and I, that's making sure you have a transparent comp conversation. Like especially now TA has been brought into that because there are laws around transparent comp. Um, so like my team is very involved. I mean, honestly, in all those conversations as they're happening. Um, and I think that's actually kind of drawn to your point earlier, of like that passion. Like I really look for people to be passionate about the other elements. Like it's not just hiring people anymore. If you're like multifaceted and you're well-versed in all the different other areas, it makes you that much better a recruiter too. Because now you can also better educate your hiring manager on those things. You can better talk to your candidate about it and let them know what the process is going to be from then on. Um, right now I'm heavily involved in making um, like career frameworks for the different teams. And my recruiters are helping me with both that and now um, talent brand. I mean, literally a recruiter the other day was like, hey, we're not posting about having new hires on LinkedIn. Like we should do that great. We went and did, we worked with the marketing team and we went and did that. Um, like so much of recruiting is also marketing and that involvement, or they were on a um, offer call with a hiring manager and the hiring manager was helping. And they're like, Oh, it'd be great if we actually rolled out like training resources for hiring managers around doing, um, around doing offer calls and around what um, L and D looks like at the company. Cause the candidate had a lot of questions about that. And I didn't have like the hiring manager didn't definitely like didn't um, specifically know what all of our options were around that. So making sure they're involved in those conversations, because at the end of the day, it makes for a much better candidate experience too. And your candidate experience, 
like that is a very fluid transition into your employee experience, right? Like at what point, <laughs> at what point does that stop? Like your new hire experience and all of that kind of gets combined together. So making sure that's really, really strong. Yeah. And, and so what's another way to, to really kind of boost the visibility of your team? Um, you know, because I, I think that sometimes maybe um, getting your team and the good things in front of all the good things that they're doing um, it can be difficult. So Jerome, have, have you found any success in how you've done that in the past or currently? Yeah, I, I think there's a bit of push and pull. So mm -hmm. you, I mean, you've got to, as, as a lead, as a procurement leader or TA leader, whatever your, your title is, I think you have a responsibility to portray the capabilities of your team to the business. I think there's a general lack of understanding around the transferable skills, just generally of individuals, let alone of people who work within the sphere of recruitment. Um, I have had multiple conversations with enterprise sales leaders. When I tell them my recruiters can sell, they're like, oh yeah, I guess they can. Mm -hmm. It's not It's not like a natural, it's not like, of course they can, right? Uh, I, I often actually argue it's harder to sell to, you know, to humans than it is to, mm -hmm. to sell products. But um, so you kind of, I think you have a responsibility to, to put that to the fore. Um, and make sure that you're putting the right individual with the right skills forward for the right opportunities. And I think I think the push element is when I talk to my team around times where there's less recruiting to do, they start panicking and like, what am I going to do? That's not recruitment. Um, and sometimes I remind them that, do you remember the conversation when you were super busy and you don't know what your career path is and you're doing recruitment today, but you don't know what if you do? Now is an opportunity for you to go and literally say yes to whatever comes on your plate. And you may love it, you may not like it, but you're definitely going to learn something from it. So whether you do two or three months, or you do six months to a year into an L&D role, into what I did, which is product marketing for three years or something else, you, you're just going to accelerate your growth mm -hmm. uh, path and your, and your skill set. So it's only going to be beneficial. So I think it's being able to play both within the organization at the right time, at the right moment uh, is really important as, as, as a responsibility as a leader, I think. Mm -hmm. And... One of the things we talked about was, um, you know, making sure that there is um, kind of a high performance track for your best people uh, and keeping them engaged um, so that they can get more access to either leadership or uh, you know, different skills within the business. Um, who's had experience? I think, Jerome, you had some experience doing that. I'm not sure if anyone else did here, but how did you set that up and and can you talk about maybe how it, how it's gone for you so far? Okay. Um, yeah. So yeah. Um, I think for, for us here, we had an opportunity to, um, I guess, identify some of the high performance, high potential individuals. And I think nearly kind of curating um, a growth path. And I think what I'm, I'm very min meaningful about the words that I choose because Sometimes people think there's like, you know, giving people promotions and mm -hmm. or creating opportunities within the recruitment team for them, which isn't the case. Like I've never created a role that wasn't needed in my team for anyone, mm -hmm. nor have I promoted people to do the same role. Um, but it's about the exposure to new experiences and, and growing that skill. And I think we've had individuals in the team who, you know, I've had a design recruiter here who's completely transitioned in being an, an HR project manager. Uh, we've got individuals here who've done um, analytics recruitment for a few years who are now content creators for our employee branding team. So you're really kind of creating those paths for people. But I think it requires being really clear on you know, where does the individuals want to go? Uh, what do they want to learn? What are they really good at from a skills perspective? But also what do they enjoy doing? Because sometimes what you're really good at doing is unfortunately not what you enjoy doing. Um, mm -hmm. So it's kind of what's that overlap? Um, and, and where does that exist within? And then really spotting that opportunity to say, well, actually, yes, I employ brand does need new content, like a career site could do with a revamp. So it'd be great. Like, I'm gonna, I am going to create that opportunity because it's going to have a business that will rely and we need someone to do it. So why don't you go and be that content creator? Um, yes, we have a ton of transformation happening across the HR team, but we have no project manager to lead it. Like, why don't you go and play that role for six months? Um, so I think it's being smart about creating those opportunities that drive a business return on investment. Um, I think that's quite a, I think it's, 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 it's a good opportunity to drive, retain high performers, high potential individuals in the team. Yeah. 
Awesome. I, I feel like the same way like we know tech debt as a term. Like you, you acquire talent debt too, right? You have loads of projects that are always, you know, in the back of your mind in that long list that you never get a chance to get to when you're in like high, high hiring times because there's simply no time, right? Like being, I would say being proactive is a benefit of having both a well kind of resourced, um, like having a well-resourced team because um, you don't necessarily have the time to get through that project list if the priority is, okay, I have to get all these people in the door right now. Um, so I think it's one kind of, most silver lining when we take a minute to slow down is you can start actually tackling all of those, start tackling all of those projects. Um, you can make sure that, um, yeah, that you kind of start making a dent on those because there's no, I guess, no shortage of things to do on the talent team at any given time of other areas that they want to branch into. So it's always kind of exciting. Once we, uh, once we have a little time, we return to, we have an ongoing kind of um, Google doc that we keep together of different ideas that we want to work on. And we visit every few months of, Hey, what progress have we made in these areas? What more ones do we want to add to the list? How do we reprioritize it? And like, this is owned by like, by the team. So that way they can keep going in and they can check off, hey, I'd love to work on this. Um, so I think that really, yeah, to your point, it really keeps them engaged in what they want to be, what they want to be working on. And I think the other piece is um, something we did a lot at my last company, and I do want to do at this company too, is um, make sure everyone on the team has really good project management skills. Cause I think that's huge to um, help elevate them both in their current role and any future role they want to go into. Like that's the most adaptable skill that's going to help them wherever they go or whatever they're working on. So really making sure that they have all the tools there. Awesome. Yeah. And what I can add to this is we had, I had a similar case. Um, and for me, it was very important um, to help the person to understand what they really want. Um, so many times people look at the organization the existing roles and then they say i'm not sure do i want to go in this team or that team or maybe i want something that um it does not exist yet right and you narrow down your options pretty much if you are just don't look out outside yeah or maybe start brainstorming in general and so what i did with that person is i literally helped that person to connect with other leaders outside of the organization have conversation with very experienced leaders and they were not ta leaders they were people leaders and said look where do you want to go what are your skills what what is your passion you know and then based on that external benchmark, that person then clearly came up with an idea of, hey, I actually want to go there. And this role particularly was or is, does not exist. The department even does not exist. But we then said, look, um, if you want to go there in a year, a year and a half, how do we set you up on a journey that you will start learning and get to know different areas in the people team until you come to this role? Where we then, you know, empowered, you have all the experience that you can add and then transition into the next step. Because so and so many times I feel like we narrow down career paths if they exist for recruiters only in TA or in the best case in people. But can we go beyond even? Yeah. Is there even something more? Because as um, everyone said here in this call, we have so many skills and transferable skills that are actually assets to the company. And sometimes we need to also lead by example there to showcase, look, this is an honor if you go to the sales department or a marketing department because your team or our team is seen as a high performance team. And now we can actually leverage the skills somewhere else, which is, it's a, I think it's great. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, thanks, Matthias. Um, I'm going to jump into kind of tech in a bit, but before I do, I think this is one question that I get a lot and it seems quite variable, variable between talent leaders is how to establish like recruiting metrics for your team. And Sam, you touched upon it earlier with tying it to the, the core values of the business and what your team it stands for. Um, but how do you make sure that they're benchmarks against market norms? Do you care? Do you use certain tools? Do you speak to other talent leaders? Do you just use your, you know, your data from your team and iterate on that and improve it over time? Like, how do you all think about recruiting metrics and make sure that they are you know, market leading or at least pushing your team to deliver excellent results for the business. Um, Sam, if you, if you, do you want to go? Yeah. Um, I say, well, the short answer is all the above. <laughs> um, <laughs> and the more, <laughs> the more detailed answer um, was both making sure they had a tool where they wanted to check the metrics and it was really easy. So I think actually, yeah, kind of segue into the tools a little bit. I want to make sure they had full visibility into that. Um, Cause if I just say, Hey, check this, 
they need to be able to see it daily and it has to be something that's like an enjoyable interface um, that they're going to go into and it's going to be really clean. Um, so that's kind of step one. And then around what the actual metrics are both. So we use, we use gem for dashboarding and conversion metrics and you can see your pipeline analytics. And the great thing there is it will both both compare you to, you can kind of pick your subset of um, companies, industry size companies you want to be compared to. So I'll both have the industry standard in there. And I can also go back and see our historical metrics. So I know specifically for, you know, this exact role, it typically takes us this amount of higher, even though the industry standard might be this. So I want to be, you know, somewhere between those taking into consideration that it's a specifically niche role and our team um, and how we're um, like bandwidth and other things I want to take into consideration because it's not just enough to say, okay, industry standard, there might be specifics, um, specific instances around your team and the role. Um, so kind of marrying that together and then, yeah, just making sure they're involved in it and they feel also consulted. Even if there's, hey, we have to hire, you know, X amount of people per month. It's also, do you feel comfortable doing that given the resources you currently have? Let's have a conversation around that. If that feels like you have too many roles or especially too many different niche roles, because it's very different if you have 10 recs and they're only across three different types of roles versus if you, if you have 10 recs and they're all completely different. Um, so making sure we're having that conversation and adjusting from there. Because if you have 10 completely different recs, I don't expect you're going to hire the same amount of people as the person who has three different recs. Um, so making sure you're really also um, customizing it for the specific person and that your ask is, is reasonable. And obviously it's a little hard to define reasonable, but especially once you've been doing this for a while, there kind of should be things you're taking into consideration. Awesome. Uh, Matthias, I'll, I'll mix up the uh, order this time. Have you got any? Uh... <laughs> yeah, I um, I couldn't agree more. I think um, the 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 KPIs or the data, right, is one of the problems that actually led us to the situation that we are in. That there's a misperception around TA, like this efficiency metrics don't add value. You need to be more experience driven. You need to focus on candidate experience. You need to focus on onboarding experience, and even sometimes if they are hard to measure. You need to also look at quality per hire. I know it's a buzzword and now everybody is like focusing on this, but really make people responsible. Most of the time it's a shared responsibility, right? But also get more advanced in this by having the right tooling, the right KPI set up. I think this is really the first step. Mm. And then with the industry benchmarks, I think what I enjoy doing uh, because of my past as I, I studied political economics before, so I always try to check out different talent markets and try to understand what's the situation there, what's actually moving, and then you can see the shifts a little bit. Because for me, um, to actually um, hire successful is always have a global um, perspective. It's never just your local market or different local markets. It's more of like uh, uh, swapping uh, talents around and be flexible also from that structure to say employee records, remote, you know, on-site mm -hmm. culture, whatever it is. Um, but um, so there you can get a lot of um, insights from different reports. And I would also argue, it, I think Sam made a really good point, is um, you need to understand what is your status quo in your organization, right? Because so and so many times you see those best practices, which is like, okay, they have invested a lot of effort and time in their hiring culture. It's a more advanced hiring culture. But if you need to handhold hiring managers step by step, it just takes longer. Yeah. And it's not just the amount of roles. I'm so happy that we actually get rid of this and have actually more of a more sophisticated capacity planning where we say, look, even if you have 10 hiring managers to chase with 10 different roles, I mean, this takes a lot, a lot, a lot of time. And so um, capacity planning could also help um, to showcase what are the recruiters spending time on? Yeah, it's not just hiring those roles. So and so many times you see sourcing is not seen by the business because they don't see it in the pipeline somewhere or it's on LinkedIn recruiter where they don't have access. So how do you actually make this more transparent to say, look, this is a lot of work. Yeah, mm -hmm. and this is a lot of things that um, because of the employer brand that we have and the status quo of the employer brand that we need to tackle that. Awesome. Thank you. There's a question from uh, someone on LinkedIn that's asked, uh, what's your source for industry standards? Um, how do you guys capture that information? Mm. I mean, I, I, I think for, mm. for us, it's my my network, so I think I, the higher network has been really useful, like other TA leaders, depending on the region, right? So, because so, often you've got differences between what you can deliver in certain countries in the MIA versus Amer countries in the Americas and, and APAC. Uh, and actually, um, 
the talent pool has actually been super useful. I think I, I think um, you guys shared some uh, time to hire data um, mm-hmm. quite recently. Oh, yeah. I think in one of the one of the one of the Slack networks. So I think it's really kind of leveraging your network, but also your experience. Like we've all worked at previous organizations. We've seen metrics that have worked, metrics that haven't worked. So you can start combining those. Um, I don't think we're yet at the stage where you've got standardized reports like you have for like comp benchmarking, for example, although that maybe that's an idea. Um, but I think just net, kind of leveraging your network and what you know in your own experience is, is a good start for sure. Yeah. And say, um, uh, Mateus just brought up a good point that I want to come back to from before too, from the um, outreach component is that, yeah, a lot of times your, your hiring manager of the business doesn't know what goes on behind the scenes to get to that hire. So leveraging tools that then show all of that. So like when we do hiring manager things, it's not just showing, okay, this is my pipeline and this is the talent dashboard. It's also going in and showing, okay, these are the conversion metrics. This is how many applicants, especially now you're going through an incredible amount of applicants and the time that it takes to do that. So actually showing what are those conversion rates? What is the outreach? Like we're focused on, um, we're focused on DE and I, what does it take to actually build a diverse pipeline? It takes a lot of time. Um, it takes making sure you're putting in that time up front to source and build that diverse pipeline. So I think making sure that not only does your team know and is paying attention to those metrics, but those are being shared with the business up front, not just the end of like how many hires and your um, your source of hires and offer accept rate, but everything behind it too. Yeah. So we're getting to the end. Uh, so I'm going to run a, a kind of like, you know, on the moment improv quick fire session here. On, te- on tech. Um, and so I'm going to go through different categories and I want your, your best pick uh, from each of you, if possible. Um, and then maybe we, <laughs> we can talk about, uh, maybe we should get some sponsorships going because you're probably going <laughs> to, or are you, maybe you can pick a, pick a few of your best picks. Um, so um, AT- ATS, what ATS um, do you, have you used or do you prefer and why do you recommend it? Why do you think it's a uh, are good for you, um, Matthias. Do you want to go first? Oh yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm totally biased. Um, my I just had two different ATS systems, and the one I stick around for now the last seven years or so is Greenhouse. Um, so why do I prefer Greenhouse? Is because when you know the system so deep, also from a technical standpoint. Um, the flexibility around the APIs that you can build, that you can customize, that you can integrate. It's a plug and play opportunity. So from a rec perspective, you can literally play your own big system, whatever you prefer. And this is very easy and straightforward. And that makes it very easy for me to actually leverage this. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Jerome? So, so mine's going to sound like a political answer, uh, but I don't, <laughs> I don't have... I prefer the ATS. And the reason for that is, in my experience, so first of all, you need to make sure you're in the right category of ATS. If you're a small business, don't go for a large enterprise ATS. Right? Yeah. You're going to be wasting your money. You're not going to get the functionalities or the interaction with the UX that you want. So make sure that small, mid-size or large enterprise, you're, you're looking at the right type of providers. But the second lens as to why I don't have a preference is because it's really all down to how well implemented the tool is. Mm-hmm. So are you clear your recruitment processes and how you want to assess or how you want to drive position management from your HIS into your ATS and track the data from A to Z? Because that's actually what's going to deliver the value of the, the success of your ATS, not the brand name that you choose. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So I think getting that implementation right from the beginning and also being willing to re-implement when you kind of figure out actually we have all these challenges uh, because it's really easy to blame the ATS, and often you do like a root cause analysis. Like but that's actually because we've changed the way that we work, mm-hmm. and the way that we, the, the system doesn't match our processes anymore. So that's I don't have a preference on that. Without incentivize people to make sure they they tag into the right categories and they look for the right size type of ATS. Cool, Sam. I say, Jerome, I generally agree with you, but Mateus, greenhouse all the way. <laughs> um, well, with the caveat that I actually haven't tried Ashby yet, and I have heard great things. Um, but from the ones I've from the ones I've used, um, yeah, greenhouse. Oh, and specifically, like I moved over from um, I moved up from Lever to greenhouse when I got here because I needed the the hierarchy on Lever doesn't quite work once you're past a certain size, which then to Jerome goes to your size goes to your point of you need the right <laughs> the right tool for your size company. Um, so once you're doing kind of job hierarchy and your jobs are going to have different interview flows, then you need something at least like Greenhouse. I'm pretty sure Ashby does that too. Um, yeah. 
Okay. What about, um, does anyone use anything for automating coordination and uh, any recommendations there? Um, Mo Sam. Modern loop. I love it. <laughs> modern um, loop. Yes. Uh, and we don't have, um, so we're, we're, we're a small but mighty talent team. Uh, we don't have any coordinators. So my recruiters are doing all their own scheduling right now. So I really need something that was going to make it incredibly fast. Um, and also we do international hiring. So it needs to work with a whole bunch of time zones because as you all know, coordinating a, you know, onsite across different time zones can be a nightmare for your recruiters. Um, so it automates all of the scheduling, which is great. Um, it also automates um, interviewer load balancing. because that was a big thing you kind of tend to use the same interviewers over and over again. We need to get out of that habit. Um, and then to the point of solving that, we need to train up new um, interviewers too. So it automates the training of interviews. So it can do the shadowing or reverse shadowing and you put people into different modules. So I am a, I am a huge fan. Awesome. Anyone else had any experience with coordination tools? I used GoodTime um, and that um, actually worked as Sam described it, um, all the features. So that was really good. Uh, but currently, we don't have that. And also, my recruiters are scheduling, and they keep on asking and say, hey, Matthias, when can we get this? <laughs> and it's like, yeah, come on, come on, come on. So many roles, no? So yeah, I, I totally feel the pain as a recruiter if you need to schedule everything. OK, final one uh, before we call it a day, sourcing uh, tools. Um, this is a kind of a hot market. There's tons of them varying degrees of success I hear from 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 them so um who's got a favorite sourcing tool and why Jerome do you have any um I've spent eight and a half years on LinkedIn but if I did not mention LinkedIn <laughs> I would probably get shot um, <laughs> I, I want to point out that like we had a direct sourcing team at LinkedIn and all we ever used was LinkedIn um so it's been a, it's been an incredibly successful team I know there's other great tools right now that we also use, but LinkedIn over the last 10 years has been a game changer. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Sam? As, um, Gem, I mean, we, we do search on LinkedIn and then Gem to send the automated outreach, whether that's in mail um, or email. And I like that tracks the outreach and it'll break it down by diversity metrics. Yeah. Nice. Mateus? Um, no surprise here. It's LinkedIn all the way. Um, so we looked at also at other areas, but I think if you know how to do a good uh, reach out, you can also use Google, you have GitHub, you have multiple different ways. So I think you don't actually need a, a different tool. Now everybody would say, no, yeah, we have special features and so on. But we benchmarked it all the time and we didn't see any difference. So for that reason, yeah, we stayed. Awesome. And is there any kind of dark horse tools that are out there that like are under the radar that you're using that um, you want to shout out that have really helped you drive performance in your TA teams? What I, I'm a big fan of, some people have probably heard about it. It's MetaView, Interview Intelligence. So mm -hmm. where you record and transcribe interviews and then you can kind of not assess the candidate so much, but your interviewers and then really train them on that and you will stop taking notes in interviews. I think this is a really a game changer for a lot of recruiters because you can increase the candidate experience and at the same time you get proper feedback on how you ask questions. And they even use um, AI notes that they give you a summary in the end and say, look, these were the answers to your questions, but also this is the overall answer of that um, interview. I think that's, that's really, really cool. Awesome. Great. Well, I don't think we've got any more questions. We went through the one question that we had from the chat. Um, we must have been so informative that um, questions are all answered. Um, but uh, thanks a lot, everyone, for joining us. Um, I hope that was really useful for everyone listening. And if you do want to join the community, you can do that at hirehq.com. We just got someone coming last minute. Um, what are the LinkedIn email reply rates that people are seeing in the past six months? Oh, Anyone have that data at hand? Uh, I ju just checked it. Um, we dropped last month to 16 or 20%, but we were on average around like 25%. Yeah. So Sam's doing a live, a live analytics check yeah. <laughs> on, on well, the fly. We've, we've actually increased. Sorry, go No, keep going. I want to look it up. Um, okay. Reply rate um, for email is, is really high. Wow. Really? 
<laughs> um, ranges from 76 to 80% reply for email. Our in-mail is much lower. Um, this month, 20. Previous month, 8. Previous month, 22. So email is getting a much higher response. Interesting. Jerome, were you going to say something? Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, I think ours is, has actually gone up. I think it was 38 to 42 percent by email but also we invested a lot of time in like training around reach outs and storytelling and so i think that's probably had a downward impact on the, the response rate probably awesome um great well again thanks everyone uh for coming um people can you can look at the recording if you join the higher community if you miss some of it um see you all next time thanks team thanks Thank you.